Friday. So Dr. Uh, Putnam is Associate Professor of History at the University of Pittsburgh, where she's taught since 2003. Her work has focused on the Circum-Caribbean, and in particular, labor, migration, uh, racism, popular culture, uh, black internationalism, and questions around gender and sexuality. Her first book, which came out in 2002, was titled The Company They Kept, Migrants and the Politics of Gender in Caribbean Costa Rica, 1870 to 1960. That was followed by an edited volume on honor status and the law in modern Latin America. And her new book, which is hot off the press, published like two weeks ago, uh, titled Radical Moves, Caribbean Migrants and the Politics of Race in the Jazz Age. And I think what she's going to be presenting here is based on uh, her work in that book. Um, Dr. Putnam is this, was the senior co-editor of the leading journal in Latin American history, the Hispanic American Historical Review, um, and she has an undergraduate degree from Harvard College and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Before teaching at the University of Pittsburgh, she uh, was a professor at the University of Costa Rica from 2002. 2003. And so it is my distinct pleasure to uh, present Dr. Putnam and her talk today titled Transnational Past and Immigrant Present to New Stories About Where We're From, Shape, Where We Want to Go From Here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, special thanks uh, to Karen for making possible this visit. Uh, it's really been enjoying my time here at the University of Maryland. I've had a chance to meet with and talk with some students, which has been great. Um, to talk with your wonderful Latin Americanists, who are always um, uh, a super interesting group. Uh, and also to hear more about the initiatives that you have away uh, in the Center for the New Americas and the kinds of interest around issues of immigration across campus. Um, so it's when I was trying to think of what I was going to talk about uh, at this lecture, there was someone asking me for a title. It may have been Winslow. It may have been Karen. Um, I thought, you know, I've been trying to. I, there was this question which I've been asking myself, and the question was, you know, what, where, where is the bridge between this history that I'm doing and that a bunch of people are doing, this sort of attempt to do something like transnational history and think about what it means to do transnational history? Where is the bridge between that and the immigration debates that are going on right now outside our doors, on the front pages of the papers? Um, and is there some way that we can be more effective in turning the research that we're doing as historians um, into uh, stories that can actually have an impact on public debate? And so the question that was you know, foremost in my mind because I was sort of struggling with it was precisely the title that I gave someone who's foolish enough to ask for a title, that is transnational past and the immigrant present. Can new stories about where we're from shape where we go from here? But that wasn't like a rhetorical question where I knew the answer that I wanted to give. It was just like, I'm really, I really want to know this. And then, you know, time went by and I was preparing for this talk and I was like, you know, that was the wrong title to give because I don't know the answer. This is not something that I've been thinking about and I've got an answer, you know, worked out. I'm ready to present with you with this clear answer. No, I gave you the question that was foremost in my mind because I have no clue. So let me begin by saying there will not be anything like a coherent answer to this question. What I'm going to try to do is um, ask you to work with me, thinking through what kinds, of, what are some examples of the ways that we could possibly pull stories out of the research that um, is going on in transnational history, and think about how they might impact um, debates over immigration in the present. This is a title you don't often see. I found it this morning, so I added it to my presentation. Amnesty for Illegal Immigrants is not enough. They deserve an apology. This is not where public debate in the United States usually is in regard to uh, immigration. And strikingly, it was from you know, the front page of a blog on Forbes.com. Um, and, the, and the author is making an interesting point. He says, you know, what has happened to America? When did the land of the free become you can't land here? He goes on to sort of develop this notion that there's no moral justification for, for laws restricting movement across borders, um, that it's completely natural, moral, and just for people to um, want to be able to move to where there are opportunities and to, to give their labor, to work as best they can, to create opportunities for their families. 
Um, and that it's, the problem is not with the people who are fought for the borders, but with the laws that create those borders and try to enforce them. Um, and so he argues, you know, if the laws restricting entry are dead wrong, then what are we to think of those illegals who have disobeyed the laws? Everyone seems to think that entering the government country without the government's permission is a serious offense, that illegals should be sent at least to the back of the line, that they're law-breaking for our stains and with dishonor. But he suggests the law is wrong. The stain of dishonor is not on the illegals, but on the illegalizers. So this is not what we're usually hearing in uh, uh, current immigration debates, and I think we'll come back to this, to this quote, to where this guy's coming from at the end. What much more common when you hear talk about illegal immigration is from this focus. This is from one of uh, five trillion and seven websites that I could have shown you um, that is firmly against any kind of immigration reform, and particularly against any amnesty or any kind of route to citizenship. Um, so in case you were confused, the, the, what's the mission? End illegal immigration. And then the next line says, end illegal immigration, end illegal immigration. And who are we? We are Americans working to stop illegal immigration. <laughs> Um, and we need you to get the facts about illegal immigration. What's the mission? This group says, our mission is to restore the self-governance of the American public, the US Constitution, and the American way of life by insisting that our existing immigration laws are enforced. And they've gone to describe the different ways that they do that. We work with members of Congress, lawmakers, local officials, moderate groups and organizations, and citizen activists to take proper civic and political action to end illegal immigration. Um, so that's one way that a, that a group is presenting itself. Another um, a sort of similar interest, this is from a, a website called christianpost.com, it's a religious website, um, but uh, talking as well, arguing against amnesty for legal immigrants, um, saying, what is it about Republican elected officials? They want to commit political suicide. The only problem is that they want to take the nation with them, arguing that they're the only, any kind of route to citizenship um, would be you know, suicide for the nation, suicide for the Republican Party, and concluding, a recent survey showed a majority of American citizens favored deporting most or all of the 11 million illegal aliens. Denying illegals amnesty and deporting some of them would be very popular with one very important group, American voters. So part of what I want to signal for you, as a preface to talking about the past and transnational stories, is that there are really two different issues at stake here when people are talking about <coughs> immigration reform. One is, who is American, and the other is what is citizenship. And often, um, and, and often the, the, the claim or the, the surface focus is that we're just talking about citizenship, we're just talking about the rule of law, we're talking about legal rights and lawbreakers, um, and who has, uh, who has broken which laws or who has which um, legal obligations, that it's simply a matter of citizenship. But actually, who is American is really contested too, right? If we look back at the arguments against um, against immigration and against any kind of path to citizenship, we see this real emphasis on, for instance, the American public, the US Constitution, the American way of life. Um, and the, what's being summoned up by that notion of the American is not a diverse America which in, in, in which many people are themselves children of immigrants or people of, of diverse ancestry, people of color. That's not the American that we're sort of supposed to be understanding or implicitly understanding when we're hearing about what the American public wants um, or about what American voters want. So that there's a sort of part of the, part of what I think gets in the way of discussions about immigration reform is that people, we sort of claim that we're talking simply about citizenship and uh, formalities, and there's a really a discussion going on that's sort of more about who counts as American. And one way they can see this, of course, is in the whole hoopla over the president's birth certificate, right? Because after all, Obama has the citizenship, right? He's got the documentation, he's got that birth certificate that says he is indeed a US citizen. And yet somehow having a uh, president of the United States who is a man of color, who's the child of a man from Africa, is such a category um, contradiction for some people in this country that it's easier to believe that he isn't a citizen um, than to sort of admit that their notion of who counts as a real American is narrower than they would have us believe. Um, and so, that you know, the fact that number, no matter how many documents uh, Obama can produce, none of those documents are actually gonna carry the day because there's a sort of deeper conviction that there's something un-American about him, um, at least in the minds of some observers. And what this points us to is that if we're talking about who is American, it's, it's there, that points us towards long-standing debates and conflicts over race and racism, culture, and notions of character. Where citizenship um, is, you know, points us towards a, both a scholarship and a set of public debates about the individual and the state. What are the individual's obligations to the state? And what are the state's obligations to the individuals? 
And I'm going to suggest that we need, if we want to move the goals, move the debate on immigration along, we need to attend to both of these pieces. Um, and we need to help people sort of separate them out. We need to attend to questions about race and culture and character and belonging. And we also need to attend to um, the story of citizenship in the state. So what can historians do? Well, basically, there's only one thing historians are really good at, and that's complicating things, right? Anytime you ask a historian a question about anything, you can pretty much count on them answering well is in it. So usually it's like a yes or no question that someone asks in a survey class, like, you know, was the French Revolution caused by, what's the answer going to be? The answer can be, well, it was complicated, right? And so anytime you need something to be more complicated, clearly the person to call on is a card-carrying historian. Um, and so what can we do? We can help complicate, which is to say we can help people understand that things are not so simple and understand the complexities of their own reactions and of the history uh, of social processes that have shaped, on the one hand, cultural belonging, and on the other hand, the history of citizenship and borders. So this is, I'm suggesting that there needs to be, these, both of these are areas where historians can really contribute, both in our understanding of who and what belongs where, um, and in our understanding of how citizenship and borders have worked and how they've evolved over time, and what the costs, but maybe also what the benefits of that have been. Okay, so what then does the transnational turn have to offer? And here I'm gonna move for just a brief second outside of the realm of public debate and think and just gesture towards an academic trend, which has been the increasing attention by historians, as well as other people in other disciplines across the social sciences and the humanities to the transnational. And what this means exactly is depends on who you ask. Um, and there are all, everyone who's in this room and was in our workshop on Friday spent a long time talking through some of these questions that you'll be delighted to hear that I'm not planning on calling with you to summarize for the other people in the room our discussions. Um, but research um, using transnational methodologies uh, uh, and research on transnational issues has focused, has you know, turned the attention of historians to processes uh, that have crossed over borders in the past. So to processes that have, uh, whether of migration, flows of movement and ideas, um, and different kinds of social, economic, political, cultural processes that have not been simply restricted to single events in a single country, but rather have linked together multiple places. So I'm gonna suggest that within the, um, within the transnational turn, within histories that we sort of frequently discuss as transnational histories, there are a couple of different genres that are sort of emerging or sort of clustered, um, and that each of them, we might think of uh, elements of each of them that could be used as, that could illuminate or at least complicate our understanding of the immigration debates um, and of the past, of both belonging on the one hand and citizenship on the other. So I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna give you three different kinds of stories that I'm gonna draw basically from the book that I just did. Um, I'm gonna draw one or two examples of each of these different genres of transnational history, if you will, that I think are potentially relevant to debates over immigration, to our understanding of both belonging and citizenship. Okay, so one of these genres of transnational history, one of the kinds of uh, history, or kinds of um, findings that historians have been creating, is the idea that, or is evidence of the fact that transnational lives are not as new as we think they are. So, and in part this response to, of course, there's been a, in the, basically I think in the 1990s or so, as the term globalism or globalization leaps to the forefront in all kinds of both public and academic debate, um, and the discipline of anthropology in particular started paying attention to transnational connections and sociology does, there was you know, a lot of excitement or, or interest around these descriptions of dense transnational networks, the ways in which people who, for instance, migrate between Mexico and Silicon Valley have different kinds of political engagements in both places that affect each other. And so you can't really understand the public participation of migrants, say, without looking both at their involvement in client politics networks within Mexico and the way this meshes with their goals over time and their engagements within, say, the United States. So people have been finding, and they can come up with other ways, but people have been finding transnational connections in the present, um, and there was a sort of moment of, um, from some, from some disciplines or from some scholars or public commentators sort of an announcement like that uh, this seemed like such a new thing that was developing. That perhaps this meant that states didn't matter as much as they used to. Perhaps this meant that we were sort of transcending uh, an era in which nation and state were the most important um, uh, uh, institutions or cultural forms impacting people's lives. Historians, of course, what are we all about? Complicating stories. We complicated that claim um, that 
trans the transnational lives were somehow a radically new thing by showing how and many different people have participated in this sort of joint endeavor. Transnational lives are not as new as we think. There are many of the, these characteristics of border crossing lives and networks that cut across uh, national boundaries um, have in fact been characteristic of past moments as well. So that's one genre that I'm gonna give you a few examples from, or maybe just one. Um, and then a second genre is the, the, the genre of things are not from where you think they're from. Now in some, in some sense, this is like a basic part of every college lecturer's toolkit, right? This is where you say, the tomato, you all think of Italian food, you can't imagine Italian food without the tomato, but in fact, the tomato is native to the Americas, so there was no pizza in Italy before Christopher Columbus, et cetera, et cetera. So this is sort of the genre of, the, the things are not where you think they're from genre. It's kind of like a cool, like, uh, turnaround. Um, but the, there's, and so will the, the variant of this um, that I think the transnational turn or some works that are done using transnational methodologies have to offer is that some, increasingly if we pay attention to the movement of cultural forms and interactions between different places, we find that, for instance, Brazilian popular music has been influenced in really important ways by very rich interactions with multiple kinds of, of popular music coming from the United States and elsewhere, and so on and so forth. So all kinds of um, cultural traditions that have been very identified with certain national identities turn out to have been generated through, in fact, international contact. Um, and so that things of the cultural forms that may claim sort of pure heritage for themselves are in fact, if you trace them back far enough, they turn out to be much more, again, complicated than that in an interesting way um, that, that gives a, a, a much more diverse sense um, of what maybe our cultural roots are. So this is another genre, and I'm gonna give you a couple of examples from that. The final point that we'll come to is that citizenship isn't black and white. And I'll explain what I mean by that when we get there. Okay, so what does the transnational turn have to offer? Um, within this big heading of transnational lives are not as new as we think they are, probably the most common kind of book that people within history have been writing is what I think of as like the border crossing bio. Right? We take some unusual figure from the past or some figure who either was famous but not as famous as they should have been or someone who's not famous at all and yet who the, the scholar has been able to accumulate a really interesting set of documentation about so that we can see that this person, rather than simply living out their life in place A, or even from going from place A to place B, had in fact you know, covered over a you know, huge range of different settings in ways that really mess with our ideas about how history worked. Um, yeah, to give you an example of a book that hasn't yet been written, but that I think should, uh, one of my uh, dissertation, one of my graduate students just finished a dissertation on indigenous politics in Colombia, and one of the people who she studies, this indigenous activist, Colombian indigenous activist from the back of beyond, in Tierra Adentro, uh, who actually uh, studied in the Soviet Union, it turns out, as a, um, you know, as part of an outreach uh, by the Communist Party in the 1930s. So this is an interesting, since we don't usually associate 1930s indigenous activism within Latin America with the common turn of tracing the life of this person from Colombia through Mexico to the Soviet Union and then back to Colombia and in all different places would give us a, a sense of some connections that were present at that moment in the past, but that we don't necessarily always see or that we don't always recognize as having been part of um, really important processes, really important histories of the past. But in my own work is not, I haven't, in, in the book that I've just finished, although I, I do trace some individual lives and I have fun doing it, but what I try to offer more than that is a sort of collective portrait of a society um, uh, uh, based on migration um, and shaped by multiple generations of migration. Um, so it's not simply one transnational life that we're tracing, but rather uh, it sort of allows us to see, I think, the kinds of transnational connections that shaped um, actually multiple generations of hundreds of thousands of people. So this is the place that I study, and you'll notice that it's, it doesn't neatly fit within any one nation's boundaries, um, which makes it kind of hard to describe where it is that I write about. Like, am I a Central Americanist? Yes. Am I, am I a Caribbeanist? Yes. Do I seem to be a Venezuelanist? Kind of. Am I also a historian of New York? A little bit. Um, so I, I don't, but I don't claim to study all of the United States, but I've got to tell you, if you want to know what was going on in West 131st Street in 1929, I'm your woman. Like, I can tell you all about that block in great detail. So the, what I did is I was, and the reason that I know about all these places and it, is that people who I study went there. Who do I study? 
I study uh, British West Indian migrants, people who left the islands of especially Jamaica and Barbados, but also the smaller islands of the Les Antilles in the wake of emancipation, looking for opportunity abroad. So that was originally there was a, um, in the early, from the 1850s onward, there was movement from the islands of the Eastern Caribbean to Venezuela. There was actually a gold strike in Venezuela in 1850, somewhat overshadowed in world history by the 1849 bigger gold strike in San Francisco. Um, but so it causes a huge gold rush to Venezuela. Then of course there are different canal building efforts in Panama. There's the foundation of the United Fruit Company, banana plantations, the Cuban sugar boom. And the, a, a crucial part of the manpower and woman power, which is making all of these different pieces of the expansion of the circumcurvian economy in the late 19th and early 20th century happen, is uh, the labor power of British West Indian migrants, people who are leaving their homes in the islands and moving from place to place, um, and building international family networks as a result. And also, it's really the, the fact that family, British Caribbean family networks are able to be flexible and to shift resources between people, to shift also sometimes children from, uh, the, from the home of their mother to the home of an aunt to the home of the grandmother and back again. Um, it's the so it's this sort of multiple efficiencies created by transnational kinship networks that make it possible for so many people to move. Um, it's that, for instance, which makes it possible for there to be literally tens of thousands of British Caribbean women of child childbearing age in Harlem working as live-in domestics um, in the 1920s. And if you look at the census data from the U.S. for the for that period, the 1920s, 1930s, you say this is a it's a bizarre demographic profile of Black immigrants in, in New York City. It's all these women in their 30s and 40s and no children. And you say where are the children? Well, if you look at uh, consular records for the U.S. consuls in places like Bridgetown and Kingston, you suddenly see exactly where the children are. They're at home on the islands being raised by, by grandmothers, by, by aunties, and other people, and then people would sort of routinely, um, so women would either give birth in the United States or, or often go home if they were, um, if a woman you know, had gotten pregnant while living in New York, um, she'd go home and have her baby at home where she had support, where she knew that baby would have support, then she'd go back to work to continue earning money that she could send home in the form of remittances, and the money that she would be sending back would both support, let's say, her mother who's raising the infant, um, but also make it possible for another younger brother or sister uh, to consider migrating to New York as well. And so you have chain migration um, through these sort of lateral branching of family support in which, um, in particular, relationships between siblings are extremely important. So any time you sort of go back and reconstruct the micro level of how these families are working, it's brothers and sisters helping each other migrate over time. And this sort of building up possibilities for the family to keep a few kids in school longer than they could have been in school and have a sort of slow um, social advance for the family. So what this means is that by around 1930, um, we the British Caribbean, British Caribbeans abroad um, and their children number about 300,000 people. Roughly half of that, uh, in a little less than half in the United States, almost all of them in Harlem, very close to 131st Street, some in Brooklyn. Um, and then fam as well, large numbers as well in Panama, in Cuba, and elsewhere across the Caribbean. So, so these are, so these, these family networks are, you know, in my mind, it's thinking through the story of these family networks is one way that we can make the argument that transnational lives are not as new as we think they are. Because so many of these characteristics of these families really match what we know about how immigrants um, and how migration works and about how families make do under uh, challenging economic circumstances uh, in the present. Now having said that, it's also the case, transnational lives that are not as new as we think they are, but they're also not immune to change. So the story here is not things in the past were just like they are in the present, and that somehow transnational family um, can you know, survive and somehow you know, not impacted by changes of, of history or changes of politics, quite the contrary. Um, part one, since the period that I study encompasses um, you know, I, I, my research is really focused on the moment, the heyday of this migratory system, which is the interwar era. That's both the time that the numbers of people involved are the greatest, and it's also the time that that migratory system begins encountering um, a series of barriers, a series of new laws that are put in place around the region that completely transform the conditions that made the creation of this British West Indian diaspora possible in the first place. Um, that is to say, and here, so here we're gonna, I'm gonna take a step out for a second and, and point to the fact that this isn't actually just a 
Uh, this isn't a process specific to the Caribbean. It's also not a process specific to the United States, although of course we know about this in US history as you know, the Johnson Reed Act of 1924. We know about the, 19, the 1920s in the United States being an era um, in which new laws are put in place for the first time, re radically limiting, truly radically limiting the um, migration into the United States and trying to select between certain immigrants who are thought to be less able to be assimilated um, and other immigrants who are thought to be preferable. Um, and, and of course, within US immigration history, there's a long uh, history of, of sort of tracing the ways that, that race-based immigration laws are first erected in the 19th century, targeting Asian immigrants, and eventually the same, some of the same systems that were put in place to, to bar Asian immigrants in the late 19th century end up being um, sort of uh, duplicated and spread and applied much more broadly to immigrants from uh, the Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, and so on. But this, this history is not just a US history, the history of the making of immigration barriers and the make is really part of a, a broader international system uh, in which a new international mobility control system is put in place, not just by the United States, but in Western Europe and indeed across the Americas as well. So, and if you think about this, in part this just has to be true. You can't have a system which demands passport in which, you know, my border guards, you know, I as the ruler of the state of Lara, um, have border guards who demand passports and visas. Well, there has to be someone issuing passports on the other side. There has to be some kind of system of issuing identity documents somewhere else in order for me to be able to demand them when you're crossing the border. Um, and conversely, uh, if I, president of the country of Lara, notice that over there in Davidlandia, um, suddenly they're blocking the entry of my immigrants and they're demanding all kinds of documents and then they're saying that we're undesirable immigrants. I'm gonna get on the immigration, I'm gonna get on the immigration law bandwagon, right? I'm gonna start noticing that part of being a modern state in the modern world is protecting borders and having a rhetoric about security and having in place all kinds of very specific things from photo documentation, ID cards, passports and visas and so on. And we can see if you sort of reconstruct the history of the issue of war Americas, you see this spreading, these practices of documentation and requiring documentation across borders um, spread from place to place. And, and if you read correspondence among bureaucrats, you can see people are paying very close attention. Within Venezuela, they're paying very close attention to what the US government is doing in regard to visas and passports and so on. Um, and so we see, and of course, so for the, for the people I study, for the British West Indian migrants, people are A, very aware of these changes because they have an instant impact um, or a very severe impact, and they're also, uh, so they're aware of the changes and they're, it's really a radical shift to go from a world in which basically there were very few barriers to entry um, up through basically World War I to a world which, in which by 10 years later there's almost no port that you can go into, um, with, well let's say by 10 years later there's no port you can go into without a passport and a visa, and increasingly <coughs> across the course of the 1920s if you are a black immigrant, there's no port you can go into, period. Right? So part of what happens is that race-based immigration laws are put in place at country after country after country um, in Costa Rica, in, well, in, you know, in the United States, although the uh, specifics of how this works to bar black immigration are an interesting side story that I'm not gonna go into right now. Um, but in, so in the United States, in Panama, in Costa Rica, in, in, again, in Cuba, the way that this is implemented is interestingly different and doesn't specifically name black race as being a barrier to entry, although in practice it's implemented in such a way that it, it does bar black people. Um, anyway, so country after country, including, this is a cellula de entidad from Venezuela, um, and this is a, actually a, a form for a US, for a naturalized US citizen asking for a passport to leave the country but to be, in order to be allowed to return back to the United States then after leaving. Um, and so the, in, and in this case it, ha it just happens, if I just like see, grab the examples that I could. So this is, this is the Cédula de Entidad for a man who's born in the island of Grenada around 1898 um, and is working in Venezuela. And this is the uh, passport application of a man who's born in St. Kitts, also in the Eastern Caribbean around 1889. Um, uh, this document is from 1920, this is from 1935. So you can sort of see how both of these men, when they were born, lived in a world in which as long as you could pay for the, the price of boat fare, um, you could go and you could go anywhere. It wasn't, you didn't have any guarantee of finding work there, but on the other hand, if you could, if you could go, if you could get to this destination, whether the Panama Canal, the gold mines of Venezuela, um, 
and you were willing to you know, bust your butt for some awful you know, pittance of wages, that you could make that choice and it could, you could make that work out for you. Um, and you could send money via postal order back to your family. But these, these men and their entire generation lived through this transformation in which suddenly, um, well, as I say, sort of by the, the, over the course of the late 1920s, this simply became impossible. This kind of uh, smooth movement across borders became impossible and there were border guards asking, literally asking for your papers um, in courts where that hadn't been the case previously. And that also means, and that, so you can see how this then shifts those transnational family ties that um, had been so important and makes it much less smooth. So if you're a woman um, you know, born in Barbados and you're working, you've got a good job, working for good money as a uh, personal maid in, in Harlem or as a housekeeper in Harlem, you can no longer just go home, give birth, come back to Harlem, and then be reunited with your child. If you do, and, and if you had already done that, trust me that you'd be able to be reunited. After 1924, that's not going to happen. So after 1924, after the U.S. Arms and Treaty Law is passed and the British Caribbean comes under quota control, um, and there are almost no uh, visas allocated to the British Caribbean, the only people from the British Caribbean who could really enter the United States freely, and even then with some you know, sort of difficulty, were the legitimate children and legitimate spouses of U.S. citizens. That, so those were categories into which almost none of the people I studied dealt. A, because very few of the people, the, 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 the um, marriage within the British Caribbean was very class-wise, it was very class-specific, and so wealthy white people in the Caribbean got married, um, and the bulk of the population uh, didn't marry or married late in life, like in the, when they were in their 50s. So it was quite common for people to be in a consensual union um, and have children. They would not be able to bring those children to the United States. They wouldn't be able to bring their partner to the United States. And if you were simply a US resident, even a legal resident but not a citizen, you wouldn't be able to offer any kind of you know, protection to you. You didn't have any state protection for your kinship ties, so you had no grounds to petition for any of your relatives, whether your legal husband or not, your legal child or not, to come to the United States. And so it's sort of this shift of those same transnational family ties that had been so, that, whose flexibility had been so crucial to allowing transnational migration to really raise the living standards of a whole generation of British Caribbeans. Um, the, those same flexible family patterns suddenly run afoul of a, an immigration bureaucracy which has um, no space for recognizing and no interest in recognizing the kinds of family connections between brothers and sisters, between grandparents and grandchildren that have been really crucial for the system. Um, and you get the U.S. Department of Labor, Immigration and Naturalization Service, now suddenly find itself in the business of interrogating people about their intimate lives um, because the, you're only going to be allowed to cross this border if you actually are still married to the person who blah, 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 blah. And so there are all different ways in which immigration agents now suddenly find themselves sort of in people's lives and in the sort of intimate corners of people's lives in ways that had never been the case before. Okay, so transnational lives are not as new as we think they are, and they're also not immune to change. They can be, they can be made much more difficult, um, and they have been at moments in the past by state policies, as state policies have changed. Okay, we're gonna completely shift gears now um, and, and talk about the ways in which things are not always where you think they're from. So this is sort of the equivalent of the tomato story. Um, but we're gonna shift into the realm of popular culture. And, um, and we're gonna shift into the realm of music. So this is the equivalent of like a seventh inning stretch. I'm gonna pause for a second and put on some music. And just like, I, I was, at one point I was gonna actually ask you all to stand up and dance, but I, I might still do that. Let's see whether you're, if you're tapping your feet when I put on the music, we're definitely gonna be dancing. So this is, this is actually a song from the 19th. This is Anita O'Day's version of a popular song from the 1950s. This is the Louis Armstrong version from 1930. Does anyone know this song? Okay, anyway, hands, anyone? Yes? David, what is this? It's a peanut seller. It but is a peanut seller. Like it's a manicero, exactly. So, a manicero. Here's a, yeah, here, this is Javier Fugat. This is one of the original, it's, it's an old Cuban folk song that then got picked up and recorded as part of the rumba craze. It was picked up then by Louis Armstrong and others. It was popular 
in Cuba, it was popular in New Orleans, it was popular in Harlem, it was super popular in the British Caribbean. Um, everyone had a version of this. I actually have a, I have a West African version from the 1940s as well. Um, so the same, this might be the Lava Sosa version from West Africa. Okay, so music travels. That's not news to anyone, but it certainly, it was as true in the past as it is in the present. Um, it was as true of the era of the jazz age as it is of the era of hip hop. And so I'm gonna take two different examples and tell you briefly that things are not always where you think they're from. So the examples I'm gonna give you are the windy hop and reggae dance, um, both of which remit us back to exactly this moment of the sort of height of the jazz age, uh, the 1920s and 30s. So let's start with the Savoy Theater. I did tell you that although I'm really not a US historian, if, there's, if you have a question about what's going on on 131st Street, I'm your woman. Luckily, the Savoy Theater is located very nearby there, just like one block up. Um, and so I can tell you something about the Savoy Theater. The Savoy Theater is, was a huge dance hall where the classic battles of the bands were played and where the Lindy Hop was developed. So this is sort of the like, ground zero of uh, Lindy Hop and swing dance in North America and really you know, in the world in the late 1920s. The Savoy Ballroom was one of a whole range of uh, new and beautiful large buildings that were part of the sort of Harlem entertainment industry. One of the ones that people know that it became well known within the US popular culture was the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was actually very much not part of the Harlem world, although it was, it was the, the musicians who played there, including Louis Armstrong, um, did well for themselves. It was a essentially a segregated club and it, it was for white patrons. So the, the crucial sort of incubators of swing music were actually not the Cotton Club, but rather these black-owned ballrooms, including the Savoy Ballroom, the Alhambra Ballroom, um, the Renaissance Ballroom, all of which were located farther north within Harlem uh, than the Cotton Club, and which catered to either an exclusively black audience or an almost exclusively black audience. Um, now, the, so the Savoy Ballroom is in this this, I stole this off of the PBS website from one of their like Ken Burns jazz documentaries. So this is the Savoy Ballroom, is where Harlem dancers invented the Lindy Hop. Um, and they mention here that a Harlem real estate businessman named Charles Buchanan both um, had, but built, he built this one, he supplied the money, he built the ballroom, and then he was the manager of the Savoy Ballroom throughout the 1920s and 30s. He was actually an immigrant from Antigua, um, from the British West Indies. And in fact, if you go back and look at all of the ballrooms that I named for you, so the Savoy, the Alhambra, the Savoy, and the Renaissance were all built and managed by immigrants from the, the, uh, from the, the Leeward Islands of the British West Indies. This actually shouldn't surprise us because Harlem, that was, that was their niche in, within Harlem real estate, or the people who really ran Harlem real estate in this period um, were people who, men who had immigrated as, very often from the Leeward Islands um, in the early 1900s and who were sort of the first sort of in on the ground floor of the Harlem real estate boom, who were able to accumulate enough capital um, that they could then invest it in multiple different ways. Casper Holstein, the numbers king, the Harlem numbers king, was another one of these men who sort of worked the wrong side or the semi-wrong side of the law. Um, but he had many sort of counterparts who, were, who stayed more or less within the realm of legality. Um, and so all of these ballrooms were owned by um, immigrant men. And this is a period, and, and the sort of what we think of as the golden age of Harlem jazz music and dance um, was a period in which fully a quarter of Harlem's population was made up of British West Indian immigrants and their children. So a quarter is a lot, right? We, I mean, you know, this Prince George's County feels like a place where there are lots of immigrants. Um, this Harlem was made, was, was in some sense in this period in Harlem, almost everyone was an immigrant from somewhere. Um, about two thirds of the population were of Harlem in this era were immigrants from the US South. Um, and their children. And about a quarter, somewhere between a quarter and a third, depending on what year you're in exactly, were British West Indian immigrants. And then you also had smaller numbers, in the, sort of the beginnings of immigration from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean as well, more concentrated in Eastern Harlem. So the, now interestingly, among musicians in Harlem in this era, the British West Indian immigrants were clearly underrepresented. So you have nowhere near a quarter of, of musicians um, were, you probably have maybe one in 20 or something like that, if that of sort of well-known musicians in this era as being of British Caribbean ancestry. But the people who were dancing to the music and the people whose choices about what to dance to and how were shaping those battles of the bands at which the, each of the two bands, that um, Charles Buchanan would sort of run the ballroom at the Savoy Ballroom 
and there would be a battle between two different bands and whoever could get the, the audience dancing, the public dancing more with like more, make it more hot, right? Um, would be the winner and would take home a larger share of the, uh, of the entrance fees. So this is really the atmosphere that shaped jazz music and the Lindy Hop dance. Um, and it's one at which the, the musical tastes and the sort of stylistic contributions and the, the sort of the like what you wanted to dance to of British Caribbean migrants was really crucial. Um, this is an image of some of the original Whitey's Lindy Hoppers. So this is sort of a jazz troupe that they put together, dance troupe that they put together at the Savoy. Um, and this is a woman named Norma Miller, um, who was one of the you know, original developers as well as some of the classic aerial moves of Lindy Hop. And she was the immigrant of two Barbados, she was the daughter of two Barbadian immigrants. She was born in Harlem, but her parents met at a dance of the sons and daughters of Barbados. So they're actually both from Barbados, they had never met on that very small island. But they come to Harlem, they're looking out, they're looking for other Barbadians. They find them at the sons and daughter in Barbados dance. Um, and I, my point here is not to show Norma, I mean, Norma was a fantastic dancer, but it's not that she single-handedly invented the Lindy Hop, but rather that she, that the tastes of people like her, immigrants or the children of immigrants, were a really important element of the mix of shaking the Lindy Hop. Um, and here, I love this, I'll, I'll read, I know you can barely read this, this is, but it's a note from the Pittsburgh Courier from 1931, describing uh, the scene at one of the ballrooms, that was actually the Renaissance Ballroom. Um, and I particularly like it because you know, someone, um, there's an interesting comment that uh, a musician who played in this era um, made about his experience within the Harlem Renaissance music scene. And he said, when he was playing, uh, mainly playing, not at the Cotton Club, but at the Renaissance Ballroom and at the Alhambra, um, people didn't even, white people, the white reporters thought that he had died because those, that was such a closed scene to, to the white people who were sort of reporting on Harlem and on the jazz scene and everything, they were only going to the Cotton Club and they certainly weren't getting invited <coughs> to all of the like, sons and daughters of Barbados dances, the you know, uh, St. Thomas Tennis Club dances. So there are all these different, uh, the UNIA events. So there are all these different fraternal societies and you know, immigrant groups who would have uh, private dances to which friends were invited at these different ballrooms there were really important spaces for working musicians in the city, but they weren't places where any of the white writers whose stories of the Harlem Renaissance had sort of entered the canon, they never went there. Those were by invitation only. Um, so this is so you don't usually get sort of pictures of what was going on you know, in the Renaissance Ballroom or in the Alhambra, um, but this is from the Pittsburgh Courier, an African American newspaper, and they're describing a sort of retro evening picnic um, gala by one of these British West Indian groups. And they say the fun of the whole evening was the grand West Indian and Cuban music that Vernon Andrade's orchestra played. I should say Vernon Andrade himself was born in Jamaica, raised in Panama, immigrated to New York, and became a, the house band leader um, at the Alhambra. He was the one who discovered Ella Fitzgerald. She used to sing as a teenager with his band before she got launched into her bigger career. Um, so they, the article goes on. Those good old timers, sly mongoose and sting no more, by which your mamas swung your papas, and the latest West Indian tunes in Cuban peanut vendor, El Manicero, uh, to which their children do a wicked bit of stepping. Three o'clock came and passed, and still the whoopee went on. <laughs> so I think you get a sense there of how, first of all, the connections between West Indian and Cuban music in this period, and the way that West, British West Indians' taste for Cuban music was actually part of what was driving its acceptance within New York at the time. Um, and then you also, you know, you see the peanut vendor and the slime mongoose, which is another classic uh, Jamaican song which gets recorded in this period. By, uh, as a jazz standard all over the place. Um, okay, so the Lindy Hop Harlem jazz is in some sense not from where you think it's from, or rather it is from Harlem, just as you always thought it was, and yet Harlem was part of an immigrant world in that time, and Harlem was deeply connected to places far outside of U.S. shores, and that made a difference for the kinds of culture and dance and music that was being listened to. So now I'm gonna jump down to a different place on the same map of you know, the place I study um, and tell you about a different kind of dance move, a different kind of dance space that was going on in the same period. Far, far away from Harlem, and yet in so many ways connected to Harlem by the kinds of family connections that I've already been describing for you. This is a picture of Panama in those years, 1930, um, and this is Limon, Costa Rica. So on the map here, this is, here's Limon, Costa Rica. It's a very small part of a very small country, but it's one that I know relatively well and care a lot about. It's an interesting place. So Limon, Port Limon, Costa Rica, down here on the coast, um, had been a center of the United Fruit Company Banana Empire in the like 1910 to 1920 period. 
Um, and it was largely settled by British West Indian immigrants in that time period. By the 1930s, um, the heyday of the banana um, export was long past. And furthermore, British West Indians in Costa Rica, all of whom had relatives in the islands, relatives in Cuba, knew someone in Harlem, they were facing that same panorama of immigration restrictions and new race-based immigration laws that had, as I had described it to you, sort of swept the region, or swept, really, it became part of um, the technology of state power and state practice across the world, and certainly within the greater Caribbean. So these were hard times in Limon. By the 1920s, 1930s, even before the, really the real depths of the world economic crisis hit, for people in Limon, times were hard. Um, and they, like people at many, like British West Indians at many other of the sites that I've described for you, um, were not only facing increasing barriers to entry as migrants, they're also facing a whole new bunch of laws that demand, that required a certain portion of the employees of a given enterprise to be natives, or to be citizens. So these are laws like in Cuba, there was in these years the Ley de 50%, the law of 50% that mandated that there should be 50% native workers employed in any given um, setting. And actually these, what I think, what these sort of uh, workplace specific quota laws were enacted actually in every one of the country, in every one of the Latin American countries I've listed for you. So you see them, they were, they were put in place in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Costa Rica, um, in Panama. Enforcement was somewhat spotty, but if you think about it, all of these are countries who can't enact quotas in the same way the United States does, right? In order to enact quotas in the way that the United States does in this period, in the 1920s, the mid-1920s, you need to have consuls everywhere who can do that. So this is what Ari Wolberg, a great US immigration historian, describes as the invention of remote control where you sort of make, you have the borders of the United States be pre-screened by consuls elsewhere. So it's US consuls in Silesia who are deciding how many Silesians will have a, a permit to get onto a boat to travel to the United States. It's US consuls in Jamaica who are making the decisions about who might be allowed or not to be allowed to have a, a, a visa that's gonna allow them to come to the United States. But of course, you, you, if you're a small country like, say, Costa Rica, you don't have consuls everywhere. You barely have consuls anywhere. You certainly don't have the kind of projection or power to allow you to enact remote control. So in some ways, these, these um, enterprise-specific immigration quotas, that is saying, if within this country, everyone, every, every business should employ at least 50% natives, it's sort of the, the mirror image of that remote control. It's kind of indoor gatekeeping, which says, well, we can't necessarily control our borders, we can't necessarily control who comes in, but at least we can control who gets a chance to have these opportunities to work. Um, so we can control some of the sort of uh, goods and opportunities that we want to reserve for citizens, we're going to have to do that at the, at the um, workplace specific level rather than through a global system of migration control. So people in Costa Rica in these years, black people, black immigrants in Costa Rica are facing, even the ones who have, were born in Costa Rica and yet um, have an unclear citizenship status, are facing all kinds of barriers to employment. These are hard times. Um, and so we see, as often happens when people are anxious and there are hard times, you see this wave of panic about youth morals, right? So, because whenever, things, whenever times are hard, this is sort of the, like the, the moral panic, oh, we're all, we suddenly get really worried about the youth and whether they're taking things seriously, whether they're getting the education that they should. Um, you could, perhaps you could put the current US testing, uh, hyper-focus on testing and on the schools and what's wrong with our schools into somewhat, it's you know, being somewhat driven by the same like massive uh, societal anxiety over economic issues being focused on the question of like, are we doing right by our youth? Are, are our youth prepared for what the future holds for them? This certainly is happening in Costa Rica. And so in this context, there's a lot in the local newspapers from Port Limon, published by and for the British West Indian community, there's a lot of concern about youth morals and what our young people are doing. And in this context, the one thing that they mention as the editors of this one particular paper get very upset about, very concerned about, are these new reggae dances that are being held. There's some uh, dances where um, where you have to pay, um, you know, a few cents to go into the dance. You get to dance all night with different people, um, and this is these are being presented in the British West Indian press as a hotbed of sin. The reggae dances that are uh, that are affecting the community. And so I'll just read you. This is the the, the first mention that I've seen of reggae dances in the Costa Rican, Afro Costa Rican, the Limon Press. Um, they argue that um, today, they say, we, we see men who are going to and fro, seeking work and unable to find it, and yet we see uh, other people encouraging, people who are organizing uh, things like reggae dances, encouraging people to be frivolous and careless. Um, 
And so they're having picnics, excursions, and reggae dances and the like. So hosting these dances and inviting young people to come. With a view that the young girls and boys must beg or steal from their parents and friends so as to be able to go to these degrading amusements. As one looks on, the reflection is, how do our leaders and spiritual educators feel when they look and see the vulgar scene in these black-bottoming, shimmying, and mentoring dances, as well as hearing the obscene language, like on and on. And further on in the same, in the same article, they return to give some more details on the kinds of dances that are, you know, um, that are that are such a threat to youth morals. Um, uh, they they are worried, and they're worried. They say that uh, young people are being alienated from their brothers and sisters, um, and they're being looked upon as an inferior, degenerate race uh, because of the music that they're listening to and the way that they're dancing, whose only aim is to follow the fox, that is to do the fox trot, which is considered a completely appalling dance because of all the jerky movements um, and the close bodies next to each other. So the fox trot was right out. Um, the follow the fox, the tango, the shimmy, the black bottom, the mento, interspersed with dialogues of obscene language, which can only be met with amongst a race whose highest aspirations are such frivolous, such frivolities, and so on and so forth. So various things are really interesting to me about this. Um, one thing is that the mix of music that people were listening to and dancing to in the moment is exactly what you would have been listening to and dancing to, you know, in New York City in the same period. You've got the mento, it's this incredibly cosmopolitan mix of music, right? You've got the foxtrot, you've got the tango, the shimmy, the black bottom, mento. So this real cosmopolitan mix of music. Um, uh, but let's take a step back. The fact that these are being called reggae dances, these places where people get together um, in a public space to listen to recorded music from all over, or sometimes live music from all over, um, is actually really remarkable. Because the term reggae dance, until we ran across this in the Costa Rican newspapers from the 1930s, the term reggae dance had never been uh, recorded or noted by lexicographers any time before the late 1960s in Jamaica. So the term, and, and there was this big debate among, uh, within the, the reggae studies community over where this term came from, because people had such, when they went back and interviewed people who'd been part of the West Kingston scene in the 1960s, they got such different answers. Like someone, Bob Marley said, well, you know, it's like that Spanish music, so it probably comes from the word reggae. So that's where you get reggae. Um, and other people said, no, it's from this raggy music, um, because people always look so ragged on the streets, or it's just this feeling that you have there are all these very disparate sort of accounts of where this term came from. But once we see that the term reggae, the term, so we now see the term reggae was being used among Jamaicans in the morning in the 1930s. We know that there's this really important migratory flow back from Jamaica, from Limon to Jamaica as times get harder and harder and harder in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, and that becomes very concentrated in West Kingston, exactly where there are slums that are forming within Kingston, and it's out of those same areas where what we come to identify as reggae music is going to be born. Um, and so actually it makes perfect sense. And the term, we, if we find, sort of look to other uses of the term more broadly in the press in, in Costa Rica in this period, it seems very likely that it came from, the, the term was sort of adopted from raddy. So raddy is, as it's in ragtime, so the term raddy to describe certain rhythms as being syncopated rhythms, and also sort of déclassé, like kind of raggy, a bright raggy music, um, was a certain kind of jazz music. It was both syncopated and not as slick or as fancy as white bands like Paul Whiteman's band uh, and others were playing. So there's raggy music was a sort of well-known descriptor, and it seems very likely that reggae, reggae dances in Limon are sort of borrowing that word raggy, um, with the, the, referring to the ragtime roots of jazz. And then this term follows the people as they go back, or in some cases, people who are born in Costa Rica but end up on the island where their parents were born in Jamaica, um, and therefore becomes sort of part of the West Kingston lexicon, and then bursts into um, sort of musical lore, or bursts into public acknowledgement in the 1960s. Interestingly, precisely in the context of these kind of, of, of public dances that are very similar to what's being described here, except in Jamaica in the 1960s, they're called sound system dances. So they're public dances, you pay to go in, it's young people dancing to music from you know, imported records from the United States, rhythm and blues, all different things, and also everyone is appalled. Like, it's the end of the world. Youth these days, those contortions, the way they're moving their body, and if you, you know, are in, if we're in Jamaica today, listening to people talk about um, um, different kinds of dan dance hall music today, you'd see the same rhetoric being employed uh, to describe the threat to national morals and all else um, from the way that youth are dancing. So the lessons that we're going to take away here is that things are not from where you, things are not always from where you think they're from, right? Whether that's the Lindy Hop or reggae dance, um, 
And just as an aside, the conviction that the youth are being corrupted as a result has a long history, and yet we've all always managed to survive. Okay, the final point that I'm gonna make for you, um, briefly, because you have been a lovely patient audience, is that citizenship isn't black and white. There are lots of different things I could mean by this, um, and, but I'll tell you what I do mean. Um, to, and to explain it, we need to think about citizenship, if you sort of pause for a second and think about what citizenship refers to, whether in normal parlance or within academia, there are really two different things that we talk about when we talk about citizenship, right? You can think of this as being a matter of the, the inside and the outside of citizenship, or you can think of this as a matter of citizenship as belonging and citizenship as boundaries. So there's a long tradition in talking about um, and analyzing citizenship referring to like the practices of civic belonging, right? And so this is you know, one of the most important social thinkers is you, he developed a, an academic um, uh, sort of uh, uh, analysis of this was T. H. Marshall in the in 1848, who talked about the growth of, who talked about the expansion of democratic participation within, he was talking about England, um, as being a matter of slowly increasing citizenship. So that first you have um, basic uh, uh, civic rights, sort of basic civil rights, which is civic citizenship, and then this uh, spreads to political citizenship, the right to vote, which slowly increases. More and more people are able to attain the right to vote over the course of um, you know, this 1800. And then finally, he, as he's talking in the 19, 1940s, um, he's arguing that social citizenship is sort of the next frontier, that is there's an expansion of things like the welfare state, of entitlement to education, um, health care, housing, and so on, and this is sort of the final element of, of civic participation and civic belonging. So in that sense, citizenship is talking about what states do for people who belong, uh, what kinds of rights are guaranteed, um, what you can expect from the state that you live in, and what you owe it as well, what kinds of participation you owe to your state. Um, so that's citizenship as belonging. But we also talk about citizenship as citizenship also means you know, this formal legal identification of each person belonging to one state um, and, and that being something which controls who can enter and who can't enter, right? So there's also this, there, we can also trace a, a slightly different history of citizenship as a legal status of which everyone has exactly one and only one, so rather than being a matter of gradation, um, it's a sort of matter of black and white, um, in which you either you're a citizen of the United States or you're a citizen of Costa Rica. Only recently are people beginning, are some states beginning to recognize dual citizenship, but certainly in the period that we're talking about, so the period that we're talking about, this should already sound really familiar to you because I was describing the growth of this international mobility control system. That's really the growth of citizenship as marker of boundaries. That's the period, the interwar years are the period in which citizenship is sort of crystallized as something that you have to have one of and you can only have one of. And if you don't have that one, you, there's no place that you can demand will take you in. So these are also this, you know, if you think about the um, refugee crises of Europe in the 1930s, 1940s, this is the period in which Hannah Arendt writes about statelessness and sort of what, how defenseless you become if you have no citizenship in this, by the 1930s, 1940s, if you have no citizenship, you have no state who will protect any rights that you have, you're lower than, you're, you're not even human. You can't, make, you can't make any human rights effective if you don't have at least one citizenship and only one. So there are sort of these two different ways that academics have talked about citizenship in two ways you can think about citizenship as a matter of participation and belonging and rights claiming, which is sort of a process the continuum, or as a matter of something that you document, you have only one of, and you need it to cross borders. So what's interesting is if you've been, as the academic scholarship in general has sort of realized or focused our attention on in recent years, these are not separate histories. That is, the development of one goes with the development of the other, but in, in ways that don't simply allow us to identify good guys and bad guys, but just to say, is the development of citizenship a happy story or a sad story, if you believe in human dignity, say. Well, on the one hand, the expansion of state commitments, that's a good thing, right? That, so the, 19, the middle of the 20th century, it's a period where you see hard-won gains for working peoples in terms of labor rights, in terms of rights to public education, in terms of some kind of the existence of some kind of social safety net, um, in terms of political participation. So we see an expansion of citizenship in the United States and elsewhere across the Americas in this period of the 1930s the era of mestizo populisms across much of Latin America, in which populist coalitions with you know, important qualifiers and so on, but there's an expansion of what states are willing to do, that more people are able to demand more rights from states in this period. 
Um, so it's less about the state simply being for the elites um, and washing their hands of the welfare of everyone else. So the era in which citizenship is expanding in terms of the commitments of states and what people are at, you know, at Buddha, as famous people are like, and with, through great effort are able to make claims on the state as citizens, that's the same era in which borders and boundaries are going up and in which people are being barred from entering. And so you see this in, for instance, if we look at the history of anti-black immigration laws, and I'm going to note the complexities in the states of populism, you see, so these are the laws, this is just putting together a, a chronology of the story that I told you earlier, uh, in which new laws are erected barring British Caribbean migration at a whole different bunch of places. Um, but the thing, so this, and this looks like, in, from, from one angle, this is like a litany of shame, right? These are all, because, because I, if I see this from the point of view of my, my the people I study, these immigrants, life became very difficult. Keeping a family together, making it possible to maintain family ties, all of these things became very difficult. People faced race-based bound barriers in new ways um, that were offensive and you know, deeply debilitating for them. But on the other hand, which, which kinds of regimes are putting these into place? They tend to be expansive populist regimes. So it's not that bad guys are doing bad things, it's that the same regimes who sort of, now if I put on my Latin American historian hat, like the same regimes I'm kind of rooting for are the ones who are putting in place the laws that are placing these barriers in the way of immigrants. So it's the same regimes that are expanding educational opportunities, that are to a certain extent even redefining the notion of nation to find in the Afro-Latin past um, different cultural elements that can be embraced. So that this is actually not simply an era of state racism in Latin America, it's really complicated. Because on the one hand, the notion of who counts as Cuban and what music counts as Cuban is expanding in these years. And on the other hand, the argument is because we're finally, we're, we're fusing together our own population, we're finally incorporating those negros, we certainly don't want the Haitians coming in. It's the worst possible moment to have Haitians arriving, we can't have them here, they must leave. And similarly, a country after country with different Matisse's different variants, it tends to be moments where actually there is a rhetoric of national incorporation and of expanding state commitments. And often, Afro-Canadians are taking advantage of that to a certain extent. Afro-Cubans are taking advantage of that to a certain extent. So it's not simply an, an era of racism everywhere that's bad for people of color everywhere. You have states that are encompassing certain people and giving to their citizens you know, new rights that we want to really like, as I say, as a historian, I sort of want to cheer for that. And yet, on the other hand, it's those same states that are putting in place borders and barriers. So these are sort of the core dilemmas of the history of populism and the history of nativism, is that you see where it's coming from, right? And you can see how effective nativist rhetoric was and nationalist rhetoric was in earning, gaining certain rights for working people in the Americas at the same time as, on the other hand, it's, it, build, it builds new barriers, it draws new lines that keep some people out. So, it's, so this is the sense in which I say citizenship is not black and white. Right? There's a happy story here and there's a sad story here. There's, a, there's something here going on that we really support and yet it, historically it went hand in hand with a process that was certainly good for some people and bad for others. It created certain kinds of incorporation and other kinds of exclusion. Um, and so as a result, and so this is so here's where I'll end with this. It, let's go back and look at the headline that I started you off with, which I found such an encouraging headline, right? This perspective that says, amnesty for illegal immigrants is not enough, they deserve an apology, because everyone should be free to cross all borders. On the other hand, where this, uh, where the columnist is coming from is, you know, he's a, he's a well-known libertarian columnist. His, the tagline on his blog is, market justice, what you earn is yours by right. So his perspective is, he's certainly not advocating a sort of expansion of social justice for all with an activist state presence, his perspective on that you know borders should be free and everyone should be allowed to go over them um, is for you know he's allowed to see things in his own way. But for him, certainly this is not part of a sort of you know unified blanket of social justice moving all of us forward together. He thinks you know what you earn is yours by right, and people should be allowed to cross borders, and states shouldn't get in the way at all, whether that's through providing health care or uh, keeping some people out of, out of jobs and erecting borders. So that's. So that gives us, I think, an interesting perspective. And so in that sense, when we ask, what does a transnational turn have to offer? I think in part, if we think about, if we reconstruct this history of citizenship and the complex, the ways in which citizenship, the history of citizenship hasn't been black and white, maybe this also allows us to see with greater sympathy and greater nuance where anti-immigrant activism is coming from, what's driving the resentment or what's driving the concern or the anxieties of people who um, want to hang on to borders, 
and feel like borders are really crucial to hang on to the things that they, like they and their families achieved over time. And so maybe there's a way in which that, in which that lesson is a really important one that we can draw from history as well. Thank you. Um, 
anyone who has crossed the border um, to do a short-term contract work, uh, anyone who is black and crossing the border to do short-term contract work was simply entering illegally. But in practice, people came in to work for gold mines, people came over to work in the cow fields, and then as the petroleum industry expands, lots of people come to work on the, on the different um, oil fields. So these are all people who are coming in nominally illegally by the laws of the book, but not necessarily so sort of being routinely allowed in. But the fact that they're nominally illegal means that by the 1930s, if you want to kick them out of the country with no due process, and so in some cases this would actually happen, you can load them onto a ship, take the Coast Guard ship, take the Coast Guard ship over to the uh, offshore of Trinidad and push them overboard. You can claim before international, you know, um, when there's, there's international pushback, you can say, these people were here illegally. They had no legal rights in this country. But sort of, so, so they're sort of weighing which laws both matter and don't matter. The laws don't matter because they're actually enacted as, as they are on the book, but on the other hand, they, the, the fact of the legal structure does matter. Similarly, the Baker Street laws, Japan has it written by the 1920s and 30s, they're still on the book almost everywhere, and almost everyone is running afoul of them. Because, but they're just not being enforced. But you have them on the book, so you can, if you, if you in Cuba, this sort of thing happens, if you want to act against Jamaican immigrants who are out of work, you can do that by alleging what well, the, the Baker Street Law you know, covers you, and therefore you're going to be arrested, fined, and kicked out of your country, similarly in the Dominican Republic. So it, it's one of the ways in which sort of national states can sort of, um, the national state washes its hands of the messy business of the micro regulation of labor markets, but regional elites have mechanisms that they can turn to that, in which they can sort of formally stay within the rule of law. But in practice, use incarceration and violence against immigrants when they want to, but only when they want to. Um, and this is this sort of similar to what happens in the US at the border, right? So this is part of this broader, I would say, America-side pattern of in certain in certain regions that are not under tight sort of form where the state formation is not so advanced and formalized and bureaucratized. Um, this sort of semi-enforcement of vagrancy laws and other laws becomes the what controls um, border making and, and immigrants. Um, and regarding citizenship and subjecthood, um, really interesting question. I can't even begin to give a short. I'll try to give a short answer. Formally, British, there is no such thing as imperial citizenship in this period, um, precisely because creating imperial citizenship would have been really complicated. Creating any kind of formal category of imperial citizenship that would be as valid for a white Canadian man as for a black Jamaican man um, would be like complete. Would be Cause wreak all kinds of havoc within empire. It was already complicated enough for empire to try to balance the demands that people were making on the ground to be British subjects. Did that mean, well, that meant if you were Indian, but you came to London, you actually could vote. But in India, you couldn't have any kind of voting and you know, participation in self you didn't even represent the government. Interestingly, um, Winston Churchill, long before he was became prime minister, argued at a big imperial conference in 1911 that what what they needed to do to make empire strong was to create a category of imperial citizenship. Here's, so it was so clear that you could sort of read what he's saying. It was all about the white domains. It didn't even occur to him that anyone might think that any black subject wouldn't be thought of them as such, but they kind of were the sort of subject of the crown. Of. So he, it didn't even occur to him that this was like opening the door for a mess, right? Whereas all these people who were parts of the, the colonial officials at the conference like go up in arms and like, no, 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 because then it would be so awkward when some people it's a matter of complexion, they use all kinds of euphemisms, um, they don't really want to say race, you know, but there's difference between the natives and depending on their level of cultural advance, and they turn over backwards. So clearly for us, you know, for Churchill clearly it's a citizen, of course that would mean, you know, white Britishers, you know, or and, and he had no idea. So so imperial citizenship isn't doesn't exist as a category. And that becomes really contentious in like the in the the created imperial citizenship um, for the UK and its colonies was created for the first time in 1948 um, by, again, by the British government, again in a moment of, of not thinking very clearly, right? Because when it was it was created to sort of solve a pending problem which they wanted to resolve like what formal status Canada could have and they wanted to keep the empire together, kind of sort of, but they created the formal status of citizenship that gave citizens, that they created no distinctions between citizens of the UK and the colonies, although like, Canadian citizenship was different, Australian citizenship was different. But then there was no legal grounds for barring British Caribbean and South Asian, Caribbean and South Asian migration to 
decay, which takes off, like, reflected, they're having this debate, the Empire Windrush, the ship that brings, you know, the first real wave of mass, you know, Jamaican migrant workers to the post-war UK, is like jockeying in London, but everybody, no one even talks about the implications of creating this, this citizens of the UK and colony status in terms of migration, which was sort of unthinkable for people in, you know, in, in, for the, in Parliament at that time, that black people could go anywhere other than the tropics. Like, if you sort of look back at the debates, that's what they're saying. Now, you know, had they called them a historian, we could have told them that for the last, you know, at that point, it's 1948, for, you know, but they've been British Caribbean going to London, going to Harlem, going to Toronto, going to Montreal. It's like, I would have known, I could have told them that this was going to be an issue, but, mm -hmm. and, and, so, and so then there are the, all these, so that's what sort of makes possible a 15 year period of incredibly intense migration from both, from South Asia and also from the British Caribbean into England, which is then cut off, so England kind of, and one first establishes the, the most open migratory regime in the industrialized world in 1948, and then goes in the exact opposite direction, 1962 shuts it off entirely. And, uh, and, and that point, at that point, all kinds of people, who, when they were born, who were British subjects, are refused entry to England, and then also are changed to Great Britain from then on. Um, so there's a, there's a history of British citizenship, which is complicated. And gender, I will hang on to. Um, you brought up an example, or you were talking about one of your students who was focusing on indigenous activism, right. which I thought was interesting. I brought up a question for me about um, what some, I've heard native feminists argue that transnational, the transnational term kind of effaces um, migration within native communities that don't necessarily acknowledge national borders. So it effaces the, the notion of the native nation because um, it's not recognized within the nation state model. So I'm wondering how perhaps the discipline of history has addressed maybe those limitations as articulated by an indigenous scholars, people studying movement or kind of global post for indigenous communities. And how's it has there been a need for history to have these pedagogical moments where they focus on the hemispheres and kind of the analytical unit versus um, the nation state and transnational studies? And what do you kind of pay attention? Necessarily address the way that nation states regulate these things. Like what what happens with the history, and what happened like in the conversations with your your students who you're working with? Is there a tension? Am I making sense? Right. Is yeah. I mean, I think in part one thing I was I was struck by saying in general people who are talking about like transnational methods within history are not narrowly married to thinking only of nations as being the relevant there that they're. You're, so you're not saying, well, I'm looking at things crossing borders as long as there are national borders. Mm -hmm. Because if you wanted to, if you were going to define things that way, then transnational methods or transnational issues would be relevant for a tiny little slice of human history and only for very certain places within it, right? So I think the first thing I should note is that most of the, to me, most interesting work that's falling under the heading of the transnational turn or is or transna transnational methodologies are uh, mm -hmm. examples of you know, asking scholars to think just to think more critically about borders and also about what units of study seem natural. So to sort of think more critically about you know why it is that we study, you know, if I study a West 131st Street, you know, I'm going to define myself as a U.S. historian rather than a historian of you know capitals with populated by people from the British Caribbean, which would be like as much of a valid category, um, and so on. So. So actually, I think the the transnational turn first of all has much to learn from border events history, but also has something to offer and indigenous history, the way that indigenous and border events history work together, um, but also something to offer there, which is to say, if if we're starting to pay attention to how borders work and also how border events work and the the limits, the ways that sort of the, the effective reach of polities is, does not, often does not reach as far as things look like they reached on the map. Um, if we want to think about how they sort of critically about space and about how territories are constituted as such, that connects in a really important way, of course, in the Americas with indigenous history. Because there's a reason that the areas that remain borderlands remain borderlands. In, if you look at, so the, if you look at the, at the, by the time, at the time of independence from Spain, right, the sort of classic map tells us <coughs> that all of these areas became part of national states, right? But if you actually pay attention to what's going on on the ground, um, there's these whole Caribbean rimlands areas here are really outside of the control of national states at the time of independence. Um, and similarly, 
you know, three quarters of the territory of Colombia is entirely outside of the control of national authorities at the time of independence. Um, these are areas that are inhabited by indigenous groups who have managed, for multiple reasons, using different strategies, to you know, keep the Spanish state from coming to exert complete control in these areas. Um, so then the, the history of, of and, and so transnational history by asking us to think critically about borders and think critically about space and how what's happening, say, here in Bogota can't be understood as sort of the, the right pattern or the true story of what's happening in Colombia, but is rather just part of the story of state building and nation formation, which has a more contentious history with different populations in different parts of the country. Um, so that, beginning to think critically about borders and about um, borderlands, really catapults the history of indigenous population to indigenous populations, in many cases, to sort of the front of the story rather than being the back of the story. So the history of indigenous resistance, say in Colombia, rather than being like an afterthought, like if you've already studied 50 things about Colombia and you've got nothing else to talk about in class, okay, maybe we'll talk about the indigenous population, but you know, they're really outside of the borders, so we, they're not important. It's like, well, if they're outside of the borders of you know, the national population, that's really important. Like, that's all the more reason to study them because we're not going to be able to understand. Or similarly, for for um, you know, for Costa Rica and Panama, you can't really understand why it is that the United Fruit Company is able to get concessions to develop banana plantations where they do, unless you understand how successful certain indigenous groups were in preventing the colonial state from exerting control over those regions so that the new national states really didn't have effective control over the Caribbean coast. Um, and therefore they were delighted to offer you know, land concessions to foreign companies to come in and build plantations there. So this sort of thinking transnationally in this sense, sort of thinking critically about borders, can sort of vault, remind us how important it is to pay attention to all of those areas within the Americas and hemispherically, just as you find out once you start thinking hemispherically, that's not, it's not just a history of, it's not a story about the populations that were sort of outside of, but rather all the different, it's the, you know, all of the areas, the areas is what sort of holds the America together in some sense are these repeated areas where indigenous populations um, that created zones of refuge, where there were, um, you know, enslaved Africans were able to escape to, and so on. There's a sort of completely different map that we can generate when we look America's wide and we think that the blank places on the map, we start paying attention to, you know, who was actually living in and the blank places on the map and ensuring that they remained outside of state control just when they could. Thanks for a great talk, really interesting. I had a thought, when you showed the birther Obama thing, and then you were talking about two different questions, one is about who's an American and the other about race, and then who is a citizen, two separate questions. And I was thinking an important thing to add to this is the way those in US history, the way those overlap, and so often citizenship is allowed, say, for African Americans in the late 19th, early 20th century after the Civil War, citizenship is allowed, but they're not, but it's not full class citizenship. And so in that sense, they're not quite American. It's a second class citizenship, it's Puerto Rican. Um, and so I wondered how that plays out, that kind of issue plays out. And, and, and I think that gets to a bond, because I think that's part of the issue, why, okay, yeah, he's a citizen, but he's not quite right, American. Right, it's one of those that he's not yeah. a citizen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Does that play out similarly? Um, well, you know, it's an interesting question. So, I mean, the, the first thing I should say is that the way that um, class, and this, I'm just repeating something that everyone in this room, I'm sure already knows, the way that class, race, and citizenship worked um, were different, were, were like importantly different um, within, you know, in different places. Um, and in, so in general, the, you didn't, you, within most of the Latin American countries that I'm looking at, right, you had sort of gradation, you had formal citizenship for everyone, and citizenship really wasn't black and white, you had sort of gradations of political participation um, limited by uh, education status and property holding. Um, and so you had, so you didn't have sort of first and second class citizenship, but certainly you had um, a sort of, you know, a nominal citizenship which with many more effective rights for people at the top, top of the, you know, social hierarchy than at the bottom. Um, and so obviously the US, the US case had some elements of that, but much more importantly, the sort of starker difference between um, uh, in, with you know, practices of 
disallowing certain rights on the basis of race, essentially. But interestingly, I mean, of course, those, those, that second class citizenship, which is so much clearer in the United States case, and such a like, starker dividing line based on race, as was visible people, to people at the time as well. But of course, that's never like, codified in federal law either. Right? That's, that's also something which is sort of delegated to local officials, in some, some ways similar to the way that I'm saying that you know, immigration control in some setting is sort of delegated to the violence of local officials, so that it's extra legal violence which is allowed to patrol those boundaries of belonging, um, so that the n national state can sort of wash its hands and say, that's not our problem. You know, it's, oh, if only they would stop lynching people in the South, but you know, that's not our problem, it's just that's a local thing, it's local extremes or local violence. Except it is codified nationally in the sense of Plessy v. Ferguson or the, mm -hmm. um, the, the acts after the Spanish-American War that mm -hmm. codified the relationship between the U.S. Right. and Puerto Rico. Right, right, right. But, but so, by, so by the 1920s, 1930s, there's no, the, the there's, there's an important distinction between, so, people of African ancestry are not formally banned from citizenship within the United States, right? In contrast to people of Asian ancestry who have been declared ineligible for citizenship by you know, immigration, the sort of evolu evolving immigration law, um, and that becomes the grounds on which um, the new immigration laws that are put in place in the 1920s bar the entry of all persons ineligible for citizenship. So interestingly, that that there is this you know, fundamentally race-based element to the 1920s immigration legislation in the United States, but that explicitly doesn't. So you can't bar black people from the United States on that grounds because you know, the amendments to the Constitution formally assert that the people, you know, the, the formerly enslaved have actually become citizens. So that's actually part of the reason why the, the way that immigration, US immigration law is made to impact British Caribbeans is through a sort of sleight of hand, so no black race is not written in as making someone in, ineligible for citizenship, despite the fact that many eugenicists at the time were like, how are we possibly gonna bar Italians and keep letting these British Caribbeans in? Um, like these, you know, these black immigrants are so much worse than the worst you know, Lithuanian Jew, how can we possibly let this happen? But th because it was so contentious, be, uh, because, and because you had sort of organized, um, you know, uh, Afro-American activist groups like the N NAACP, who at the one time that there had been an effort to, and actually like 1908 there was an effort to make black, to bar black immigrants from citizenship on the explicit basis of race, and it was like a brouhaha, there, there was like public outrage led by African-American act Afri um, activists, and so that was, that was discarded. Um, and so that's why the U.S. government ends up sort of instituting this sleight of hand through which the Great Britain's non, all non-self-governing colonies within the Americas are placed under quota control um, in, by the you know, Johnson Reed Act of 1924. Um, and then they just don't allocate visas to any of the consulates in the Caribbean. So you don't actually have to, that's a way that you don't actually have to say. So interestingly, you know, usually we think of the U.S. as being <coughs> explicit about race-based discrimination in contrast to Latin American countries, but this is a case in which you've got countries like Panama, Costa Rica, Cuba talking explicitly about race, and the United States doesn't say anything about black people being not allowed to enter, and yet in practice, that's made to be the, the dividing line. But more broadly, the point you're making was very visible to people at the time, and that's really that's why it put the the new immigration law in 1924 really put people into a bind because suddenly, if you're a citizen, you can petition for relatives, not all relatives, but legitimate children and legitimate spouses. That's a big right that as a citizen you have, that as a permanent resident you don't have. But if you're a black person and a black immigrant. You're, that means you're choosing to become a U.S. citizen when you're so aware from everything you see around you of how limited that citizenship really is. So, people, so there's constant, there's debate on this continually in the British Caribbean press within the United States and beyond its borders. Like, do we really, should I, like, shall we naturalize? Do, do we really want to become citizens of this country? Are you kidding me? They're like, why on earth would we, you know, there, and yet there's, there are certain very material reasons why you know, it's very, it, 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 it helps you keep your family together if you become a citizen. There's certain opportunities that are open for you if you become a citizen. So people go back and forth on this because they're aware of just the kind of distinction you're pointing to. Yeah.
kind of sense of what the history of international connections looks like, just how new globalization is, and whether you're going to prove it, you know, tell us where it came from, or show that it doesn't actually exist at all, or so that there's no new inequitable process in the direction of connections in, in, in any way that's qualitatively new. Sort of similarly, some people who have championed the idea of transnational history have sometimes explicitly, sometimes explicitly located it as um, a sort of, how does that mean, antidote to post-colonial studies, but as a sort of more materialist, a, a sort of way of looking at um, connections across borders and the flows of people and culture um, and interrelations um, between different geopolitical boundaries, but with less of an emphasis on the cultural, which is associated with post-colonial studies, um, and more attention to sort of the hard facts of the economy and laws and so on. Now, not everyone who is interested in transnational history is doing it because it's a weapon in the fight against post-colonial studies. Some people, quite the contrary, would say the reason you know, transnational methods are, are you know, it's a, it's a sort of methodological toolkit that is, you know, allows us to build on the insights of Embedded to post-colonial studies, and it allows us to build on those insights. So again, you, you could have completely different. I could, you know, I could supply uh, publications that make completely different arguments about where the transnational fits in relation to post-colonial studies. Um, so I think it's, it's the, in some ways the term transnational right now is kind of up for grabs because it, it currently it doesn't quite mean all things to all people, but there's a little bit of that. It, you know, sometimes you could just toss it in to make yourself feel good. <laughs> sounds so trendy, and like if I put that in, if I say transnational rather than international, surely that shows that I'm not essentializing something. Um, you know, there's something that I'm avoiding essentializing, and so so I think the jury is still out on whether this will, whether meaning will cohere in a specific way, so that using that label conveys important information, or if it just continues to be sort of nebulous and different people mean it in different ways. Probably five years from now we won't be using the term because it, it, if it means too many different things, it's just too ambiguous to be a useful term to use in academic analysis. So, so you know, the jury is still out, we don't really know, I think. Any more questions, comments? We should, we should let these poor people leave. We should <laughs> let you <laughs> get, leave. <laughs> yeah, great. No. I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy to keep talking, but I'm sure all of you are thinking, I've got to get home, it's going to start snowing. There could be three whole inches of snow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry, not, not making fun of you people. <laughs> well, thank you very much.